Fans loved his innocence and authenticity. He was a genuine player. He played for fun and to entertain the crowd. And the fans realised that. That was Manny Garincha, the joy of the people. He had a childish spirit. Garincha was football's answer to Charlie Chaplin. In his position, he was the greatest player I've ever seen. There was never a case of a woman being beautiful or ugly for him. Garincha was terrible. He'd sleep with anyone. On a Monday, when he didn't turn up at Botafogo, you could find him playing football in his hometown. And that was Brazil's right winger. Garincha was an alcoholic. There was a time in his life when he was barely playing anymore, and that, yes, he lost his way a little. He lost his way. He started to lose that spark and joy that he'd always had. His eyes that had always shone so brightly began to look sad instead. And unfortunately, we ended up losing one of the greatest players of all time at such a young age. Sweden, 1958. Brazil were due to face the USSR in their final and decisive World Cup group game. The Soviets were pioneers of a new scientific football and feared by the Brazilians. However, the Brazil side contained two young stars who'd been held back from their opening two games, Pelé and Garincha. The world was about to witness three minutes that would change football forever. It was in that game that both of them came in. The selectors had a long talk, Garincha had been training well and Pelé had recovered from an injury. So the two of them started against the USSR and they did something spectacular. Both players made an immediate impact, but Garincha in particular was mesmerising. His close control, dribbling ability and mazy running had the opposition tied in knots. The Soviets went on to lose 2-0. But in those first three minutes, the world had witnessed the emergence of a new power in football. The magnitude of the occasion was lost on Garincha, however. He hadn't even realised Brazil had qualified to the knockout stages and sent the Soviets home. He thought there would be another round of matches. After the game against the Russians, we'd knocked them out so they were leaving. We were all sat down watching them leave, and Garincha came up to us and said, Who are those big guys? We said, They're the Russians, we beat them yesterday, we knocked them out. He replied, Won't there be a second leg? That gives you some idea of his mentality. He didn't have the same sense of responsibility as your normal national team player would. Even with Brazil, he'd do his thing and play his way. But it was brilliant. And that's what was good and important. That irresponsible streak had initially cost him his place in the starting lineup. But now his dribbling skills were crucial to Brazilian success. Nilton Santos would shout, give the ball to Mané, and Garincha would get the ball, dribble down the wing, and then cut it back for either Vava or Pelé. A lot of the time, you'd get one player here, another there, maybe three players marking him, and he'd dribble past them. He was very explosive. He could go past anyone. For Garincha, the final against the host Sweden was just another game. It could have been one of the kickabouts he regularly enjoyed with friends back in his hometown of Pau Grande. But yet again, he managed to mesmerize the opposition. He'd dribble, get to the byline and cross the ball in. So much so that in the last game against Sweden, he made two identical runs. They resulted in two goals for Vava, who was our main striker. The 5-2 win against Sweden gave Brazil the trophy they'd dreamed of since defeat in the 1950 final. Football had changed forever. For Garincha, life would never be the same again.
Manuel Francisco dos Santos was born on the 28th of October 1933 in the rural town of Pau Grande, near Rio de Janeiro. No one, not even Pele, contributed so much to the myth of Brazilian football and its identification with the beautiful game. Here was a player who brought joy to the masses with his carefree attitude and blissfully innocent desire to entertain. Yet his own life was blighted by tragedy. Garincha was as brilliant as he was reckless. His story began here, on the rough pothole pitches of his hometown, where he honed his extraordinary dribbling skills. But the young Manuel had an even greater passion in his early years. Oh, he had a great eye for hunting. As soon as we disturbed the birds, he'd bring one down with his first shot. And that's how he got his nickname, Garincha. It was the name of a little bird, a wren, that you still get around here, that he loved to kill. We'd go out hunting and say to him, Garincha, let's not kill any wrens. They don't even give you a meal. But he wouldn't care. He'd still kill them. That Garincha rose to the top of world football is even more remarkable when you consider that he was born with such a disability. Garincha era... Garincha was a physical impossibility. He had one knee that went in and one knee that went out. Normally people have both knees going in or both going out. In theory, he shouldn't have even been able to walk. Despite his physical limitations, Garincha soon became renowned throughout the region for his footballing ability. He was the local team's star player and it wasn't long before he attracted the attention of Rio's big clubs. However, by the time that Botafogo came calling in 1953, he'd already been rejected by a host of clubs and was disillusioned. After the disappointments at San Cristóbal, Fluminense and Vasco, he didn't want to try with anyone else, not even Botafogo. He thought he'd just go down to Rio and people would mock him, calling him a cripple or bendy legs. He'd had enough. When the boy with the bent legs arrived at Botafogo's training ground, he was immediately thrown in against the national team left-back, Nilton Santos. When he had his trial, they all saw him with his strange bent legs, and so got Nilton Santos to mark him. And so training began, and he dribbled past Nilton Santos. So after training, Nilton Santos grabbed hold of Garincha and took him to the president. He told him, Sign this guy here, so I don't have to play against him. At Botafogo, Garincha was a phenomenon. He played with innocence and irresponsibility, with relish and with brilliance. Twist one way, stop the ball, twist the other, and the defender would fall over. He never did tricks to mock his opponents, he did them because that's what came into his head. There was nowhere marking him, no one could stop him. When Mane got the ball, everyone was desperate to see what he would do with it. He was born to play like that, and he was all crooked and bent with those confusing legs, and it probably confused his opponents even more. His ability was drawing comparisons with the other young star of Brazilian football. Garincha and I played together in the national team for around 12 years, from 1958 until Garincha passed away. When Garincha and I played together for Brazil, we never lost a single game. We were unbeaten. <laughs> Not one to take football too seriously, Garincha quickly established himself as the dressing room joker. He had the mentality of a child and not an adult. He was always joking around. He didn't take anything seriously. I remember one time, I was in my team suit with the long trousers and everything, and I was giving an interview. This was in Rio, and I was giving this interview in the press room full of people. And do you know what Manny Garincha did? He came up behind me, pulled my trousers down. I was shocked. I had to pull them up. But that's what he was like. Joker. He was effectively a child in an adult's body, but supporters identified with his desire to entertain. So much so that he transcended the local rivalries between teams in Rio. 
Acho que é o I actually think that Garincha is the only player who is loved by every single fan from every single club in Brazil. Garincha doesn't belong to any one club. Everyone in Brazil supported Garincha. It was the joy of the people. That was the way he played. He even entertained his opposition. It was marvelous. I don't think there'll ever be anyone like him again. I loved Garincha. I'd support him, even though he played for Botafogo. Because I wanted to see him do those things with the football that he could do. I think we just had to admire his football. And his football was helping Botafogo win titles too. The club had been established the best team in Brazil a long since. And they became even stronger in 1958 when they added a young striking sensation, Amarildo, to their ranks. He saw firsthand why Garincha was regarded as the most amateur footballer professional football had ever produced. Botafogo had Garincha, Didi, Quarantinha, Zagallo, Milton Santos, all regular international players. So I was gobsmacked. For me, this was the biggest club in Brazil, with the biggest players in Brazilian football, with the exception of Pelé. There were games that Garincha wouldn't even know the name of the team we were playing. He wouldn't know. When he stepped out onto the pitch, he knew he played for Botafogo, and he knew he had to win, but he wouldn't know who he was playing against. He'd always ask, who are we playing against today? We're playing Vasco. All right. Football was just a bit of fun for him. It wasn't a serious job where he looked to earn a lot of money. What money he did earn, he squandered anyway. With continued success for both club and country, the trappings of fame were inevitable. But Garincha had no interest in becoming a superstar, heading back home whenever the opportunity arose. Although married to childhood sweetheart Nair, the father of eight daughters, Garincha, was a notorious womanizer and drinker. He'd go missing from Botafogo for days, only to be found back home in Pau Grande recovering. Or with the latest girl to take a shine to him and he would still play football barefoot with his childhood friends after a training session or even a game. He lived here. He was always here. When he didn't have something going on with Botafogo, then he'd play here, either up on the little pitch or with Pau Granji. He'd always play with us. He'd leave Rio after a game, and go back to Pau Granji, and there would be a kickabout going on, so he played that too. After a game, Garincha and his friends would invariably head to the bar. Garincha was no stranger to drink. His father had been an alcoholic. It obviously ran in the family. We always loved to have a drink. There's a bar over there, and that's where he'd go on his benders. Garincha really liked the beer, or at least a drink or two. He had two great loves in life, beer and chasing women. The man was terrible. Nothing got past him. He could play on Sunday, get drunk on Monday, not train on Tuesday, appear hungover on Wednesday. On Thursday he'd train. On Friday he'd go dancing and enjoy a party. On a Saturday he'd recover in time for Sunday's game where he'd light up the Maracanã. In 1962, Brazil travelled to Chile to defend their World Cup title with largely the same squad as 58. But this time, Pelé, Garincha and their teammates had the weight of the world's expectations on their shoulders. In 62, Brazil arrived as favourites. The rest of the world had discovered us in 58. So we arrived in Chile as world champions. But we had the same staff, the same mentality and the same ability. 
o, o jogador que mais se destacou realmente nesse campeonato o mundial. O player que realmente se destacou nesse campeonato foi Manny Garincha. Ele foi apenas fora desse mundo para nós. E ele assumiu o papel de líder desse time. Ele assumiu assim a liderança né, da seleção. Ele assumiu assim a liderança da seleção. An injury to Pele in their second game meant that Brazil were without their recognized star for most of the tournament. Suddenly, Garincha could step out of his more celebrated teammate's shadow. He realized in that World Cup that now he was the principal actor. Now he thought, I'm not just a bit part player, I'm the star. In that World Cup, Garincha scored from a free kick, he dribbled as always, he scored with his head, he even scored with his left foot. He was inspired in that World Cup. I think a saint was watching over him. He carried Brazil by himself. Garincha had never been a leader in his career. He never paid attention to tactics and coaches saw no point in trying to teach him. He played, he enjoyed himself, and he went home. But in 1962, he became Brazil's leader and inspiration. He did things with the ball. God, he even scored with his left foot. He practically carried the team on his back. He took the responsibility in every game. He did things that I'd never seen him do at Botafogo. In the quarterfinals, England were ripped apart by Garincha's pace, tricks and his newfound eye for goal. He scored twice in a 3-1 win. He was phenomenal against England and they were a good team. To have stopped Garincha, they would have needed a machine gun. Fortunately, they didn't have one. Hosts Chile were on the receiving end of another virtuoso display in Brazil's semi-final. Again, he scored twice. Brazil were now entirely dependent on their mercurial winger. I always say this. I know of only two players who have single-handedly won a World Cup. Garincha in 62 and Maradona in Mexico 86. Despite being sent off at the end of that semi-final, he earned a last-minute reprieve to play a starring role in the final against Czechoslovakia. Brazil won 3-1 to retain their crown. Garincha was voted the player of the tournament. His stock had never been higher. Back in Rio, life only got better. He helped Botafogo to a Rio State final win with a performance that many claimed to be the greatest in his career. But just as he appeared to have reached his peak, things were about to take a drastic downturn. Garincha's carefree life was beginning to catch up with him. From that game on, Garincha was never the same again. Look at my phone, his chaotic personal life didn't help. Since 1961, he'd been involved in a tempestuous affair with bossa nova singer Elsa Suarez. The affair had been revealed and the couple were vilified. The hero of 1962 had now turned public villain. More worryingly, though, he was struggling on the pitch. Garincha had succumbed to a long-term knee injury from which he would never truly recover. When he started to become the star of the team, he was contracted by Botafogo to play more. They had to play him in at least every other game. And so the fact that he wasn't a natural athlete meant that he was given various treatments and injections to stay fit, and that finished him off. He had arthritis because of the problems with his legs. And it reached a level where it really began to hurt and he just couldn't fight it anymore. He didn't have that same explosiveness because of the hurt. There had to come a time when he just had to stop. 
It wasn't just the injuries. His drinking was now beginning to spiral out of control. His childlike and carefree naivety had been endearing in the past. Now it was leading to his downfall. Gorincha right until the end of his life was naive. If he met nice people, he'd go off with them. If he met not so nice people, he'd go off with them too. Everything was spontaneous, not given any thought. Gorincha, let's go to church, and he'd go. Gorincha, let's go drinking, and he'd go. And unfortunately, he was surrounded by a lot of people who made him do that. But there was still a place for Gorincha in Brazil's 1966 World Cup squad. With a military dictatorship now in power, his call-up was a political decision. The government wanted its heroes from 58 and 62 to play. Sixty-six was more political. We had to take players who'd been champions in 58 and 62, as both our president and president of FIFA wanted a celebratory atmosphere like before. I was 36. How could I really play? It was a joke. The same could have been said for Gorincha. This wasn't the same player who'd been voted player of the tournament in 1962. He'd been considered surplus to requirements at Botafogo and offloaded the year before. He was now overweight and out of shape. He was only half the player in the 66 World Cup, as he was very much coming to the end of his career. But it was still Garincha. As far as I'm concerned, what he was able to do on the pitch, no one has done since. He could still produce moments of genius, though. A thundering free kick in the opening game against Bulgaria was testament to that. But his touch and speed had deserted him. Defeat in the next game against Hungary was his first in the Brazil shirt. He would never play for his country again. Garincha, the footballer, was finished. He wasn't in the right condition to be playing for the national team. His knee was finished by that point. He still played, but he shouldn't really have been there. He wasn't the same Garincha that we'd all seen before. He was now a totally different player. He was now a pale imitation of his former self. No longer drinking for pleasure, Garincha stumbled from one alcoholic stupor to the next as he attempted to revive his career at various clubs. But his body could no longer cope with the physical stress of professional football. He'd lost his way, but while he was a footballer, he'd have a few beers after the game, and it wasn't an issue. He never gave us any problems at all. It was only once he stopped playing that the problems began because he couldn't sweat out all the alcohol and he started suffering from things that he hadn't suffered from before and so all this inevitably hit him hard and brought him down and depression began to sink in. Depression soon gave way to suicidal thoughts. In 1969 he suffered a car crash that instantly killed his mother-in-law who was sat in the passenger seat. Garincha blamed himself and tried to take his own life twice. The Brazilian FA should have shown a lot more concern because of what he did. Given what he did for Brazil and what he represented, he deserved a lot more and he didn't get it. He died with practically nothing. On January the 20th, 1983, Garincha died, aged 49, of cirrhosis of the liver. In the previous 12 months, he'd been admitted to hospital eight times. Up until his death, his body would violently reject anything that wasn't alcoholic. Brazil finally mourned its tragic hero, Mane Garincha, joy of the people. I'll never see a player like him again. Whoever saw him got lucky. It's such a shame that Grinch's life ended the way it did. He didn't deserve that end because I'm telling you, he was a genius. Everyone else was a great player, but not a genius. He was an extraordinary guy, a great teammate and a great friend whenever you needed him. I just hope God has given Manny Grinch a good place up there.
He was out of this world. 